Special thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Stick around for later to hear more about Squarespace. Now, I know everyone has their favorite Spidey cartoon and the usual picks are one of these three, depending on when you were born. For three different generations, these are the definitive adaptations of Spidey in animation. But there's a middle chapter in here from the early 2000s that is often looked past. One is a series that seemed like a strange and unique idea that no one really gravitated towards, and another that was ambitious and mature but didn't quite catch on. These are the two unloved middle children of Spider-Man cartoons, the ones that only lasted 13 episodes each, the ones that don't get much fan art or belated action figures or a video essay about why they're so awesome. But I'm in four videos deep, so I'll be the one to cover them, I guess. I told you part three wouldn't take seven months, it only took 15. Which tells you my level of interest in making Spider-Man content at this point. Haha, <laughs> not a Spider-Man channel, so funny, I love that joke. <laughs> don't don't put that in don't put that in ben don't put that uh, ben ben justice league unlimited this show is bizarre it's not based on any comic storylines in particular it features dozens of original characters it doesn't even take place on earth and it's not a sequel to the previous cartoon they try to trick you and make you think it might be a continuation with this little musical cue what could possibly be but they didn't get permission to use that shit. Spider-Man Unlimited was one of those shows made to fulfill a contractual obligation, not because anyone was really eager to make it, which as we know leads to some of the best superhero stuff. Marvel Entertainment and Fox Kids had a deal to put out another Spider-Man show in 1999 to reinvigorate the Spidey brand after the 90s show was canceled. Originally, it was supposed to be some kind of super low budget motion comic style adaptation of the first 26 issues of the books. But then Sony and Marvel made a deal to do the movie. We all remember the movie? This one actually came out. And part of that deal was a side cartoon series that would use the comics as source material. This conflicted with Spider-Man Unlimited's production, and when the dust settled, they were told that they weren't allowed to use any of Spider-Man's supporting cast, his classic costume, or adapt any comic stories from the classic books. So the producers are like, well shit, what do we do now? Oh wait, Spider-Man 2099 is a thing because it's the 90s. So for about a week they were working on that, but then decided it was just a little too similar to Batman Beyond, which was already in itself very heavily influenced by both versions of Spider-Man, for its main character being a high school superhero and its setting being in a cyberpunk future. It's a ripoff of a ripoff of a spinoff. For a while, they were settled on having Spidey go to another version of Earth where his Uncle Ben hadn't died and he didn't have the mental fortitude to fight off the symbiote and became the venom of that world. Then one of the producers was like, no, Clone Saga will live in infamy and this is the 90s so that's a really fresh wound, so don't do two Peter Parkers! And as such, we finally got this end result. This is a weird Frankenstein's monster of all these rules, stipulations, and sources of inspiration. It's kind of Batman Beyond, because look, he's got a fancy suit, he could turn invisible. It's kind of Spider-Man 2099, jumping on car, he's got the cape. It's kind of classic Spider-Man, and uh, it's, I guess it's like kind of Thundercats 2 somehow, and it's, um, it's not bad. Well, okay it is, but I also kind of like it. The plot of this one, which I'll admit is a bit of a nightmare train wreck, is that scientists have discovered there's an identical planet to Earth on the opposite side of the sun from us that's got its own advanced society and civilization just doing their own thing. How no one on either planet managed to notice this before 1999 is beyond me. So they send astronaut John Jameson there to go make first contact with the local populace. Except for reasons not explained until later, Venom and Carnage are compelled to hijack the shuttle and go to Counter-Earth 2 for some nefarious plan. As a kid, I was instantly annoyed that Carnage and Venom were teaming up and referring to themselves in the singular, and also, like, morphing around like Clayface. A symbiote is gooey, yes, but you can't walk through a chain-link fence with one. There's still a human being with bones inside there, man! Even the show calls this out as being weird and wrong, but they don't explain how or why suddenly they can do this stuff. Hey, you two could never morph like that before. I just may be outgunned here. 
Or why these sworn enemies that hate each other in a dozen other comics and adaptations are just like... Just calling each other brother and are like total besties now? Can't us? What have you done with our brother Benham? The first episode is my favorite of the whole show because it's the one that feels the most like an actual Spider-Man cartoon instead of... All this other weird stuff. Peter Parker fails to stop Venom and Carnage from boarding John's shuttle, and he has to fortnight his way back to the familiar planet Earth of people who think he's a colossal dumbass that can't do nothing right. He's a social pariah and gets his ass kicked constantly until he's just wondering if he should hang it up for good. But he sees a transmission from John Jameson saying everything on Counter Earth has gone real counterproductive, and he needs some help. So Spotily Mang steals some unstable molecules from the Fantastic Four, makes himself a video game unlockable costume that's stylistically designed to be impossible to cosplay, and makes off with his own shuttle to Opposite Land. Listen up, world! This is Spider-Man, on my way to Counter-Earth to save John Jameson and clear my good name. And I'm going with him, Peter Parker. After all, what newspaper man could turn down an opportunity like this? You could tell this show was written really fast without a great long-term plan because that makes no goddamn sense. Let's say everything goes great, and he gets John home really fast. How's he going to explain why only Peter Parker or Spider-Man are going to step off the spaceship and not both? Oh yeah, Spider-Man, um, heroically died on Counter-Earth or something. Just me now. That could be how he quits in this show. Cause Spider-Man are always quitting on me in this time period. Were they going to have him explain to John the double identity thing and they'd have to come up with a plan together? Maybe just land the shuttle far away from people and then say Spider-Man got out and ran off on his own and it's just Peter and John there. I don't... I don't know. Either way, he set himself up for failure because three people need to walk out of this thing at the end of the journey. Think before you speak, dude! And we get to the main setting of the series where it gets a lot less interesting. Oh. Counter-Earth is a land where a scientist who now calls himself the High Evolutionary has learned how to accelerate evolution in animals to make them bipedal and intelligent like humans. And then he decides that those are way cooler than humans and asserts that as the new dominant species in society under his rule, while normal humans are considered the lower class minority because they're not big cool rhino dudes or tiger guys. Yeah, yeah, get your jokes out now. Spider-Man escaped from the planet of the furries. You'd think the mutant animal people would be considered the freaks and treated as the oppressed class on this planet, but somehow it's flipped. And also this planet has flying cars and way more advanced technology. Spidey discovers John Jameson has joined the underground human resistance fighting for equality with... with the bestials. Yes, that's... they're called the bestials, these things. We couldn't have found a better name? It really had to be that? How did not one person on the production think that was strange? Were they laughing and thinking the kids wouldn't get it so they could just get away with it and it's all a big joke? Anyway, Peter lives in a slum in Counter Earth's New York with some doctor that's a landlord and her son and sells pictures of Spider-Man to another newspaper on this planet because sometimes you just gotta stick with what you know. Also, he teams up with the Resistance and battles a rotating cast of Counter Earth variants of established Spider-Man villains. Like Electro, but he's an electric eel. Yeah, that'll do it. Or Craven, but he's actually pretty much just exactly the same as normal Craven. He just has a different haircut, I guess. I can't believe Rhino and Scorpion weren't here. That seems really obvious. Maybe they, maybe they weren't allowed to use them. This show is so crazy. I blame this show for all the damn nano machine suits in the movies. How do his shoes fit inside the fucking? How does it do that in both things? I'm confused. Though I do wish this costume would appear in something other than the games and that weird comic where Carnage was replaced by another Carnage from an alternate universe so it got really weird and convoluted. Yeah, version of this world got killed off by Moreland and Spider-Verse, but they said it's an offshoot, not the canon ending to this show or Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Don't you even bring up that dumb bullshit in the comments, you goober. See, another one of these guys is over here in Spider-Geddon a few years later. He's fine. There's like an infinite number of Spider-Man Unlimited universes. Cause that's, I mean, that's how that works. I will praise this series for a few things. The art style is incredible. I love the heavy inking and the vibrant colors on the backgrounds. These character designs are really complex and detailed and I can't believe they made those poor animators draw these frame by frame. 
I wish we could have another animated series that looked this good because this style is great. This is the best looking of all the 90s Marvel cartoons in my opinion. And of course, the voice acting is pretty good. Reno Romano was chosen to play Spidey and he did such a great job they brought him on board to voice the two video games from around this time. A Spider-Man made off with Octavius' new invention, but not THE Spider-Man, not me. Somebody's framed me. Why? I don't know yet. And if New York's finest catch me, it may be too late. Even though those were kind of offshoots of the 90s show. I wish he'd voice this character again in something because I'm really nostalgic for his performance from these games. Plus, he's got enough range that he also voices Counter-Earth's version of Green Goblin, who's actually an anti-hero and member of the Human Resistance. Yes, there's only one thing to do. It's dangerous, but the fate of the world depends on it. I will do what no other superhero on the planet would even consider. Drafty in here. Also, my pal Gary Chalk is here as Counter-Earth's New York newspaper editor-in-chief. Subscribe to Xavier for more videos like this one. Once again, this series is not in continuity with the 1994 show. Even within this show, they have flashbacks to this Spidey's version of the Symbiote Saga, and it's similar, but still out of sync. Ending with Venom being brought in by S.H.I.E.L.D. instead of the police, and him choosing to make Carnage as a partner to help him fight Spider-Man, instead of all that nonsense with Baron Mordo and Dormammu and what the fuck. Plus, Cletus and Eddie swapped hair colors for some reason. You really only need to watch a handful of episodes of this show to get the gist, and then there's a lot of filler in the middle that's not particularly good. Sorry, I just don't care much for the tragic backstory of Git, the mute guy that is made of sentient bandages and wears sandals. All the stuff focused on Venom and Carnage is way off from the comics, but are some of the stronger episodes in this show, weirdly enough. Eddie Brock's character is still pretty well preserved in this. He's just under some kind of mind control from Venom being connected to a hive mind of green prehistoric symbiotes that live on Counter-Earth and have over time evolved into insects or something. I could barely follow this show, but I don't dislike it. You could put it on and zone out while running on the treadmill because Comic-Con is right around the corner and you gained a lot of depression weight during the last two years, but hey, you're finally married and things are a little better, so it's time to start taking care of yourself again so you can feel confident wearing spandex in a public space. Rejecting slightly. But alas, Pokemon was a runaway success and most animated TV networks at the time wanted to chase that money train so Marvel stuff was left in the dust for a bit and this show was shut down before staff writer Larry Brody could script where to go from here. This series feels like it was destined to end abruptly. There's no way this could have carried on for any more than like two seasons maximum before it got tedious and even weirder. Even if they did outline plans for 11 more episodes after this, at some point you just have to let Spidey go home. It ends on a monster of a cliffhanger where everything goes wrong all at once, the villains get away, and Spidey and friends are buried under a collapsing building while an army of symbiotes invades the whole city like those three video games where that happened. How season 2 could tie this in a neat and tidy bow, I have no idea, but I'll give it my best shot! Hey, self-plug, go read my fan comic. I can't make money off of it, but I like when people tell me I did a good job and pat me on the head and say they're proud of me because my mom never did, because she's just like, Oh, you listen to your wife when she tells you to do the dishes, but not me, I see how it is, Xavier. Anyway, Spider-Man Unlimited. This time, he's gone too far! The all-new, all-improved Spider-Man. Davison's rescue is my responsibility. The only one who can bring him home. After all the times I've risked my life for this stinking city, this is the thanks I get. Some things don't change. No matter where I go in the universe, everybody hates Spider-Man. Please, help. But there's one request I can't turn down. Perfect society nears completion. How long have you been following me? Long enough to know your deepest, darkest secret, Parker. Soon we will have an army of symbiotes. Someday, somehow, back you will be. Not great or terrible. 
Certainly could have been a lot worse, but it's such a strange and off-the-wall show, and there's no way they'd make something this dramatically far off from your traditional Spidey ever again. I find it special just because of how unique it is and the fact that it happened at just the right time before a show like this could never be made again. Because the movie came out shortly after and skyrocketed Spidey's popularity to new heights. Now everyone had a pretty standardized idea of what Spider-Man stuff should look like, and all the shows hereafter would follow suit. The closest to the cinematic Spidey being this handsome low polygon gentleman that has the same haircut but was allowed to cuss and go to parties with beer. Spider-Man had a rough transition to 3D. From the fellas at Mainframe Entertainment who brought you Uncanny Valley Nightmare Fuel and the most underrated Transformers cartoon, comes Spidey's first foray into a fully 3D animated setting. Boy, we've come a long way to Spider-Verse. This series was produced by Brian Michael Bendis and originally started out as an adaptation of his and Mark Bagley's Ultimate Spider-Man books. Early into the show's life, Bendis himself penned a pilot for the show and it was eventually picked up by MTV. Which is a weird choice, but I, I, I guess I can't see this really running on Fox Kids as it is. You can see a lot of Ultimate Spider-Man influence on the visual presentation of this show. A few years later, when the angsty little rascal himself had his debut in a 3D video game, he and his world ended up looking very similar to this take. Cell Shaded 3D was new at the time and was a very popular style for comic book adaptations. I wish more stuff looked like this these days. The look of this show is really special, and while not aging as gracefully as the aforementioned video game, it's still really impressive for the time, and as much as I love Beast Wars... This show looks a hell of a lot better than the studio's previous work. This time around, Mainframe Studios were given the task of creating a new Spider-Man show to coincide with the success of Sam Raimi's mega-blockbuster event of 2002. With a director who previously worked on CG television shows, backed by a studio who pioneered the first fully CGI cartoon reboot, Adu Payton was very eager to give Spider-Man a fresh spin with a stylish coat of paint the team set out to do something that had never been done before. They wanted to bring the colorful and dynamic lighting of a comic book to life in a way that couldn't be done with traditional 2D animation on a TV budget. Alongside the obvious Ultimate slash Bagley influence on the youthful look of our characters, I do also cited Romita and Todd McFarlane's artistic styles as having influenced the show. We've been looking at comic books, uh, uh, John Romita Jr.'s work, uh, John Romita Sr., um, uh, McFarlane. Uh, a number of great artists have um, supported the Spider-Man stories over the years, and for us, one of the first steps was just to put all that stuff in front of us. You can even see the McFarlane-dubbed spaghetti webbing he popularized during his tenure at Marvel made its way into the show. Plus, this is the only cartoon Spidey that frequently does these back-breaking Todd McFarlane poses with ease. Ha damn, that is a flexible man! I hear a lot of people say this show is unwatchable, and the animation is ugly, and it looks bad, and blah blah blah. And you guys are spoiled by your damn Nickelodeon Ninja Turtles, and your Clone Wars, and your small titty goth GF show. All this movie quality animation on television now, I can tell none of you bitches had to contend with Max Steel. No, the old Max Steel. It's not that far off from these other shows from around the same time, but the cell shaded filter goes a long way to hiding the seams, I think. Plus, the actual animation, which is different from art style, is buttery smooth. This Spidey moves like water! He's so fast! And these moves are badass! I love the fight choreography in this series. We still haven't gotten a Spider-Man that can zip around like this in more recent shows, and I think that shows the strength of the 3D keyframe fight scenes. All of the Peter Parker daily life stuff is motion captured to feel more casual and believable, but Spider-Man's movements are hand animated to make him feel more super, and it really sets the two halves of the show apart. I think the art style also allowed for some really cool shots of Spidey at night with full black shadows and rim lighting that look really dramatic. You can get some cool wallpapers from this shit at least. Give them a break kids, they tried their best. They forgot to put the cell shaded filter on that lab coat in the background, so that has smooth shading, so... So this sucks, actually. Zero out of ten. This show once again follows college freshman Peter Parker, who seemingly has gone through the events of the previous year's theatrical mega-hit. There's quite a few cartoons that start like this. 
for the live action movie is implied to be the backstory behind the show, but it obviously branches from the story of the movie if it's set between sequels. Like the last show, there's enough here to place this squarely in its own universe, such as MJ, Harry, and Flash Thompson going to ESU alongside Peter, and the Osbournes aren't exactly themselves. But it's close enough to imagine at the time that this was continuing the story audiences were eager to see more of. Before the sequel came along and completely squashed this poor cartoon's hopes and dreams of ever being canon, Spidey's got organic webs and shares the same emblems and shiny webs on his costume, Norman is dead and Harry blames Spider-Man for it. Harry, I get that you think Spider-Man killed your father on account of he did. If only I could cause you the pain that you've caused me. First we'll see who's behind the mask. I can look into your eyes as you die. Spider-Man. No. He can't be. Peter is working freelance for Jameson, and Mary Jane and Spider-Man mention sharing arguably the most iconic movie kiss. Well, sure, there was that kiss, but it's not like we ever went out salsa dancing or anything like that. Peter faces off against a bunch of C-listers and original characters throughout this series, likely due to restrictions from Sony as to not have two conflicting versions of Doc Ock or Black Cat, since she was originally considered for the sequel. A whole lot of that going around with these shows. Just very specific circumstances that result in something that's quite unlike anything else before or after. We see a handful of familiar faces like Silver Sable, Electro, eventually Craven, and poor old Doc Connors. Oof, this uh, this didn't have a happy end. But the greatest of them all, Michael Clark Duncan's Kingpin makes an appearance, making this Spider-Man also dubiously canon to the Daredevil movie at the time. But outside of them, it's all new guys created just for the show. A couple of them don't even get their names dropped, so you have no idea what to call them. Talon is this universe's resident cat burglar, but most people would probably forget about this newspaper prop and just call her by her real name, Cheyenne, since Talon is never actually spoken out loud. You could honestly just replace her with Black Cat in your brain, and this episode still works exactly the same. The leader of this terrorist group with high-tech jackets and sci-fi guns called Teradax doesn't even get a prop calling attention to his name. I had to look at the concept art for the show to find out what it was, and I still can't remember it. Trying to watch this show nowadays is incredibly annoying because not only is it almost never streaming on anything, but when it is, or when you purchase it, it's always out of order. It's always listed in its air date, which is unfortunately all over the damn place because it turns out creating the future is really difficult with 2002 technology. Episodes that canonically come first are often held until later in the season because they just flat out weren't finished yet. Whatever was ready was what came out, which means characters that haven't been introduced yet will walk in a frame like you've known them for a while, or events will be called back to that haven't happened yet, Max Dillon becomes Electro and then dies and then shows up in class again to tell Peter not to mess around with one of the many thousands of goth girls voiced by Tara Strong that made it in here. Only the DVD release of the entire season has the episodes right. Here's the order for anyone interested, by the way. Other than its animation style, the thing that really sets this series apart from every other Spidey cartoon is its maturity. Since it was aired on MTV, this was a TV-14 show that could mention alcohol, depict characters drinking and smoking, show firearms and blood and death, and they could even cuss. Hello, good guy, saved your butt, me. Underground now! Damn it. And some of these episodes got pretty damn dark. It's pretty much everything the 1994 series chose not to do all packaged together. And I think it makes a strong case for some of these more adult elements also making for interesting and dramatic storytelling. For example, this show's take on bullying pulls no punches with showing the origin of Max Dillon, a shy nerd looking to fit in with the cool frat guys, into the deadly and murderous Electro. They torture this poor kid over and over, but he's so desperate for their approval, he puts up with it with this weak, fake smile. The bullies invite Max to a frat party, which is just a trick for another brutal hazing prank that leaves him feeling humiliated and powerless until his powers activate. Because he's secretly a mutant from X-Men, I guess? Look it up. And the first thing he does is kill the guy who picked on him all this time. 
and Peter reaches out to him, knowing what it's like to be bullied and given the powers to finally stand up for yourself. He pleads with Max to settle down and stop hurting people, but he's just too manic to listen to reason and sees everyone as his enemy. In the early 2000s, post-Columbine, there were a lot of animated shows doing episodes like this, but of all of them I've seen, this one just feels the most brutally truthful to the reality of things. It doesn't end with them making up and being friends and going to school together like normal. It ends in a graveyard. I just hope wherever Max is, he's finally found some peace. <laughs> it's a really powerful episode that demonstrates the full gambit of what this show was capable of doing that no series before or since could. But this series also has its lighthearted and fun elements too. I really love the banter and chemistry between Peter, MJ, and Harry in this show, and no Spidey cartoon outside of this has really nailed that dynamic the same way. How about if I come late? He's not coming. I'm serious. He is so not coming. Yeah, unless later means never. never. Hello, I said I'm coming. What am I, invisible? This MJ feels closer to the comics version than Kirsten Dunst because she's more the pursuer in the relationship and wants to get to know Peter and get in his head. And he's the one who brushes her off and puts up a wall. I think Harry thinks maybe we have things to talk about. I, uh, uh, yeah, uh, these binocs are pretty, uh, fly. It's kind of flipped from the movie relationship where Peter's chasing her at exactly all the moments when it's most inconvenient in her life. And she's like, are you fucking kidding me, bro? I'm marrying the leader of the human resistance against the bestials. I can't do this wishy-washy shit right now, man. That poor sad werewolf man was abandoned at the altar. Harry Osborn is also a funny-ass character in this show. <laughs> you suck, Osborn! <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> He's such a chillaxed dude, bro, and he only gets intense when Spider-Man is brought up. Like, of all the Harry Osborns in all the cartoons, I think this one is the most charismatic and the one that's like, I could actually see why Peter would be his friend because he's not just an annoying, sniveling dweeb. I've already got it all figured out. Actress parties, supermodel parties, actress and supermodel parties. Yeah, I'm sure MJ can't wait for those. Oh good, then we're on the same wavelength. Peter is voiced this time by Neil Patrick Harris, and I think he gives a really strong performance. Hot roof, hot roof. Ah. Welcome to Spidey's Cardio Workout. <sighs> what the? <laughs> he doesn't sound like Tobey Maguire, really. He's just doing his own thing, and it works. He's got this really nerdy nervousness as Peter Parker. Actually, Spider-Man is a man. Sort of. But his voice becomes very commanding and strong as Spidey. And I've even heard that they pitched it down a little so his Spider-Man could sound more intimidating. I think that's a cool idea. I'm gonna rip you apart, Draven. Hey, you know what I'm feeling right now? Yeah. No, but I'm going to a whorehouse and I'm gonna get my f on. If you two don't wanna get your dicks wet, that's fine with me. I honestly really like this series and their take on the Spider-Man mythos. Something still comic booky, but also very down to earth and close to reality. I think Spider-Man The New Adventures of Batman or whatever deserves a little more love. If you can look past the admittedly aged visuals, you'll see that the story is pretty solid. But as with all weird 13 episode long cartoon shows that were canceled abruptly, cliffhanger! The new Spider-Man series of animated episodes about Spider-Man ends with a two-parter where these villains called the Gaines Twins use mind control powers to turn Spider-Man into their personal assassin to get revenge on Kraven the Hunter for a personal vendetta they have against him. Spidey really lets loose here and it gets pretty brutal in this fight until he comes to his senses. When he goes after the twins for putting a brain whammy on him and kidnapping Mary Jane, they trick him into injuring his friend Indy Daimonji, a journalist that Peter has a romance with throughout the show. She's put into a coma from him not pulling his punches with her, and he feels like Spider-Man is just too dangerous to leave unchained. So he hangs it up. And by hanging it up, I mean he puts it in a suitcase and throws it in the river. This is one of the only Spider-Man stories, to my knowledge, that actually ends with him definitively going, Nah, this sucks, and quitting permanently. Obviously, this was going to be resolved in Season 2 as their attempt to adapt Spider-Man no more, but it never happened! Imagine if Spider-Man 2 just ended right here.
It's such a bummer of an ending. And this series wasn't cancelled because it had low ratings, it was actually doing very well. MTV just decided it didn't fit in with the rest of their programming because they were getting away from adult animation more into reality shows and irredeemable, annoying garbage. 24-7 shows about rock stars remodeling your house! It's the same reason the Beavis and Butthead reboot got canned. No, not the new reboot, the other reboot from 2011. They're really doing that twice? Same with Futurama? Man, 90s kids just really can't let anything go, can they? Would the world, like, come to an end if Spider-Man took one lousy night off? Okay, you made your point. Ever wonder what my life is like? It's like this. Cut me a little slack. I'm trying to catch a bad guy. The only bad guy I see here is you! I can't catch a break. There's someone else. Anybody I know? I don't think he even knows. Excuse me. I let the X-Men get to go to parties. Hands in the air! Choosing a side of good doesn't necessarily make you a hero. Not with everyone. These two shows are very strange and distinctive compared to everything else we've gotten for Spidey in the realm of animated shows. I commend both of them for trying something really different that gave them such strong defining traits. And while neither of them are perfect, and can both have some real duds for episodes, they also have some strong ones that are worth checking out if you're a fan of the character. They both understood and utilized Spider-Man in interesting ways, and I think they deserve some recognition for at least attempting something cool, even if these attempts were formed by stringent mandates and troubled productions. Maybe think of these as like one show that was a weird anthology that switched off concepts each season, so it's less depressing that they both got tossed in the trash so quickly before really taking off. And even though these were both a little out there in their own ways, a more traditional Spidey show was still on the horizon. I'd be a down and out, broken, depressed Spidey too, if not for sponsors like Squarespace. Squarespace gives you a user-friendly and beautiful platform to maintain and run your very own website. You can connect with your site's users through gated, members-only content, as well as sending email notifications, leverage audience insights, all on one easy-to-use platform. You can create your own community with comment sections with threaded comments and likes. These handy blogging tools built in can help you easily categorize and share posts on the site. You can get even more from Squarespace with third-party extensions to manage inventory, promote products, streamline bookkeeping, or whatever else your site needs to run like a well-oiled machine. And you can even display posts from your social media on your site to make sure your followers are connected and can share them too. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash this special code to save 10% off your first purchase for a website or domain.